High on the Hog is a 2021 Netflix documentary about how Black American food culture and styles of cooking developed and provided the foundation for much of America's food culture. Over four episodes, the show's host, Stephen Satterfield, a food writer, visits various locations to learn about Black food history and traditions. The documentary does a great job of showing the historical connection of the Black diaspora shared culture. While touching on both familiar and unfamiliar topics, this approach to discussing Black American history feels new and refreshing. See the full review on the North Hestoir YouTube channel website. I first watched High in the Hog shortly after it premiered and thought it was pretty interesting. As someone who loves food and history, especially Black history from across the Black diaspora, it was perfect for me. It connects with a few topics that have usually been quite separated in other documentaries, books, etc. This creates a telling of history through food and culture. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because food and culture can tell you a lot about people. Food can tell you about the kind of produce that is grown in an area. Cultural traditions tell you a lot about what the people value and how that relates back to their history. Yet so often when discussing or reading about history, the focus is on particular facts, figures, stats, and events that took place. Things that happened to people or people moving from one place to another and interactions that they might have had with other groups. History isn't always told through culture or rather History can be told through culture, but quite often it's not explained through those pathways. There's a greater focus on the cold hard facts and figures, and for lack of a better term, these softer pieces of culture are less explored. Watching the documentary, I really appreciated that it zoomed in on people. I enjoy learning about history, and especially lesser-known history. When I read books and movies, I like to analyze things and get beneath the surface, but also love reading other people's reviews or critiques where they address the things happening on the surface, but also dig deeper and get into symbolism and themes. With history, there's the mainstream, the often told story, but when people dig more deeply, it adds another layer of understanding. This thing that we do in the present, or this thing that we call by such and such name, people have been doing it for generations or even centuries, and you know, the name is derived from this other world. I find that kind of stuff to be pretty cool. So early on in the first episode, I like the conversations that Satterfield has with Dr. Jessica B. Harris about food history while they're in Benin. Years ago, Food Network aired the Alton Brown show, Good Eats, where he would dig a bit more deeply into food to discuss the science and history of various dishes and food traditions. It wasn't like a dedicated episode, but I think maybe it was a segment on one episode where he was talking to these food historians about like the history of food and food traditions, like black food traditions, which was actually quite interesting. So there's something similar going on here. It's not something that you see very often. There's some podcasts and things like that, but it's not something that is readily available on the Food Network or some of these other channels. I subscribe to a few food magazines, so I follow behind and reading them, as well as like travel magazines. And it's one of the things that I really like about these magazines, where they take these things that we take for granted or stories that we wouldn't necessarily hear elsewhere. And they dig into the history of these various topics, like the background of them. So for example, I enjoyed the conversation about yams versus sweet potatoes and how with yams in the past, not being readily available in America, but still being kind of similar, though different from sweet potatoes, people erroneously began to use the terms interchangeably. Okra is something that I grew up eating. And I know here in America, a lot of people eat as well. But there's conversation about how it's actually an African vegetable, something that's eaten in Africa, like in different African countries and used as a thickener. There are words that we use now without necessarily realizing that they have histories that go back generations past. Something like okra, where the doctor explains that the French word for okra is G-O-M-B-O, pronounced gumbo, which if you think of it, it's like the dish that we associate with um, New Orleans here in America, right? The okra dish. They discuss this reddish oranges rice dish where they speak about like the different types of rice, right? And while in Benin, they talk about Nigeria rice and that the word they use for the type of rice or the word they use to describe this specific type of rice is jollof, which is like a Nigerian dish. It's also prepared in some other countries, some other African countries, but it's closely related to Nigeria, this combination of tomato and rice. If you think about it, 
you have something like jollof rice here in America, which would be jambalaya. In Caribbean countries such as Guyana, where my mom's from, they make something similar called cook-up rice, which is like rice with meats and sometimes shrimp. If you think of jambalaya, right, it can have chicken, shrimp, sausage, other types of meat, vegetables maybe, but it's like a tomato base, right? Similar to jollof rice, where that has a lot of tomatoes. They put meat in it sometimes. And in Guyana, where my mom's from, they make something similar, right? They don't necessarily put tomato in the rice, but at the table, we typically put tomato on it in the form of ketchup, or at least I do. It's this thing where there's different adaptations, but it's pretty cool that it's like kind of the shared history or practice, right? Where you realize just how connected the diaspora is, where it's like this simple thing, like this rice dish, it might be called different things, but when you pay attention to it, you can recognize the connective tissues between the different cultures, that it all relates back to our shared past. It's like a simple thing like this rice, where it's a staple in these different environments. So you have jambalaya in New Orleans, you have cook-up rice in the Caribbean, you have jollof rice in various African countries. And so as the episode moves on, there's this conversation about some of the new and upcoming chefs in Benin and how they're taking these traditional dishes and not necessarily adapting them, but kind of modernizing them in a way. For people that grew up in Benin or some of these other African countries, you eat these things, they're what you grew up with, they remind you of childhood, right? They remind you of things that you would have eaten in your family's home. But at the same time, the way it's being presented in these restaurants is new and different, right? They're adding like influences from other things, right? So so these traditional dishes that are made new. And so you see that with different things, right? You get a peek into like around the diaspora, the type of food that people eat, how things were then and how they're changing now. So with this channel, I focus on black history, but I'm curious about world history and cultures. But through black history, I see myself. It doesn't mean that I don't appreciate other cultures, because I actually appreciate the history of other people. You know, certainly I've traveled to other places. I try other kind of food, but it's interesting to read about Africa given the disconnect. And as is mentioned, the food like looks really good, but you have this thing where there are hierarchies in different areas of society. And unfortunately that exists within food as well, where you have certain types of cuisines that are elevated and celebrated and then others that are just as good, but they aren't given much respect. It's unfortunate, but it's like the food that they were making the stuff looked pretty good, right? I thought it was interesting that like um, the host of the show, he mentioned living and growing up in America where quite often you can be made to feel like an outsider. He lives here in America, but you're not exactly welcomed in society with open arms. And so Satterfield speaks about having this experience of going to Africa. You look around and you're not a minority there. Right. It might seem like an insignificant thing, but as someone living in America, especially when you go to places where you're the only black person, it matters. The experience that he shared was sort of how I feel when I go back to my mother's country, where black people comprise a sizable portion of the population. You know, you go back, you walk down the street and people look like you. You don't feel like an outsider. It's like you're not from there. Right. Not to be overly dramatic, but it's like you breathe a little bit easier. You can relax a bit. You're not quite as on guard. Not to say that you're reckless, but it feels like coming home. I haven't had the opportunity to visit Africa as yet, but I would imagine that you'd have like a similar feeling there, or at least it's what I've heard from other people that have visited. While still in Africa, Satterfield and others get into discussing the history of slavery. I appreciated that they just dove into some of these heavy topics right up front instead of trying to avoid it. We are in talking about the history of the slave trade that unfortunately, yes, Africans did participate and the ramifications and implications that would have for them. And then all also for the diaspora as a whole. I feel like in recent years, especially as I've dived more deeply into learning about black history, whereas before it was like more of a sporadic kind of thing, it's been interesting to learn more, to get a deeper understanding of what exactly the slave trade, and particularly the journey of the Middle Passage, what it entailed, right? Because so often it's glossed over. You don't get a thorough understanding of what it was like. And even to some degree, it's like, you get to understand as far as how it was here in America, right? What slavery was like for the enslaved here. And that's certainly important to learn about. But 
Here you get a deeper insight to understand the full journey, the generations of this, what it was like for number one, the societal setup in Africa that allowed for this to take place and the different people that played a role in the slave trade. I've read a few other books and I think maybe watched like one or two documentaries and you see these slave castles, right? Where they're pretty much forts and fortresses on the coasts in Africa that still exist to this day, where people would be loaded onto ships and brought to the Americas. It really helps to drive home the point. It gives you, it's like it takes history from being a very abstract thing that was decades or centuries in the past and happened to other people to being this real thing that you can better relate to. And so I respected and appreciated the way that they discussed the slave trade here, right? The insights they offered as far as how things worked out, how things played out and what the experience would have been like. A huge part of traveling for me is eating food. Any place I visit, I don't want fast food or quick serve unless I'm like here in America and I'm just on like a road trip and getting from point A to point B and I'm just grabbing something while on the highway. But aside from that, when I'm traveling to places, that tends to be a huge determining factor as far as where I go on trips. You know, what kind of food can I get? One of my favorite things to do when I go to other places like other countries, other towns, cities is to go to their local markets. So here I enjoyed the instances where he visited local markets. There's a few different markets that he visits. One of the coolest would be in Ganvi, a floating village on a lake. They have boats, people live in houses on the water. That would be absolutely terrifying for me because I'm afraid of open water. But it's cool to see. And it's like, especially when he goes to like the floating market, which is it's like one of my favorite moments. So it's like you have this village on the river that came about due to its founders seeking haven from the threat of slave traders. It reminds me of like when I go to Guyana with my mom, right? They go out and about, but my favorite thing is to go to the market and see what fruits they have. That's like the highlight of my trip to buy fresh fruits, you know, kick back with a book or something like that and just relax. And so I enjoyed seeing him go to like the market, trying different things, different sweets and treats. Stuff like that is completely up my alley and exactly the kind of stuff that I would like to do on any kind of vacation. So in recent years, having now lived in Atlanta for a while and met people from other parts of the South and traveled throughout the South, I think I can comfortably say I've been exposed to different accents and bits of culture, right? Things like that. But I specifically remember in visiting South Carolina, Charleston in particular, and meeting people, aside from that, um, from South Carolina, that the accent struck me, especially when I hear like Gullah people, it instantly sounds familiar because it sounds like the accents of people from certain West Indian countries. So Satterfield visits South Carolina and they have a conversation about the history of rice where so often when we think about slavery, we think about cotton production and black people being forced into the labor of helping to produce it. But the reality is that while cotton certainly was a major crop, you also had other crops and things like that being grown and cultivated through slave labor, right? And one of them was rice. And so it's explained that much as with what happened with cotton, that rice production helped to make Charleston an incredibly wealthy city. It helped to create a lot of wealth within the city. And they discuss like the importance of rice to the local economy. And with that, the importance, the economic impact that slave labor had on Charleston's economy, right? The impact that enslaved people had on Charleston and through Charleston, the South's culture. It's mentioned that Charleston is regarded as being one of America's great food cities, which I think is entirely true. I visited, I think the food that I had there was really great, but less attention is paid to, or less mention is made of enslaved people's role, the role that they played in Charleston, in the development of Charleston's cuisine. So here you have it where Charleston is regarded as this great food city, right? Much of the cuisine is heavily influenced by, or rather has its foundation in the food that was prepared by black people enslaved black people, but yet in the present, it's overlooked. This is the reality with a lot of culture in America, where much of America's culture comes from black people, but racism dismisses black people in their contributions. The talent and creativity of black culture will be viewed as negative, right? But as soon as possible, separated from black people. Mainstream society will denigrate the habits, practices, culture, etc. associated with black people, but then turn around and appropriate those practices for its own use. Or some white person comes along, deems it as being good and worthy, and it's 
it's then deemed socially acceptable. We see that here with the food culture in Charleston. But I like that when Satterfield got out of the city, he went to meet with Gullah people. And again, because of this thing of familiarity, there's like an older man who appears with his wife and a younger guy they've influenced. The younger guy is a caterer and chef, BJ Dennis. But when I heard the younger guy speak, his accent sounded like, a Caribbean accent that I couldn't quite place, like maybe Trinidadian. The older man's wife sounds American, while he sounds Bajan, as in someone from Barbados. One of the guys mentioned that being isolated on the sea islands allowed for the Gullah people to hold on to more of their African culture and traditions. They're in the Southeast, but they don't sound like people from other parts of the South. When you look at the food, the way they speak, those things, it, it seems familiar to me. As someone born and raised in America, but of Caribbean descent, you know, I watched the show the first time with my mom and she noticed the accents as well. So it was super cool to see the interplay of history and food in this context, right? Culture as well. But the unfortunate reality as we move into more modern times and, you know, things are getting more expensive is that that's going to have an impact on their culture. I visited Charleston in 2017 and then in 2021, I visited Savannah, Hilton Head and Tybee Island during one trip. I went to both places during the summer. They're relatively expensive to visit, especially when you're visiting close to a holiday. When you visit these vacation hotspots where people go and they take their families, it can be pricey. For the people who have been living in this area for generations, they're now dealing with gentrification. There's gentrification everywhere, seemingly. Seaside resorts, vacation accommodations, and so much of what's being built is catered toward visitors and tourists. It then makes things very expensive for everyday people, locals who just live in the area year-round. The isolation was a gift before because it gave the Gullah people some distance from the slave masters. Yeah, they were enslaved, but they were able to maintain some cultural distance because the slave masters weren't living down in these areas, right? Because of the living conditions. But now it's becoming a con because being isolated means things have to be obtained from the mainland where it's more expensive and people might have to move for work opportunities. The third episode splits his focus between the South and Northeast, with Satterfield journeying to Virginia, Philadelphia, and New York City. Philadelphia looms large in the history of Black people, as it was the first state to abolish slavery after the Revolutionary War. In 2021, I visited Philadelphia and had an amazing time. I previously visited on a day trip, but my 2021 visit was specifically focused on Black history. I learned a lot about the history of black people in the city and that a lot of them were caterers and restauranteurs. Philadelphia was the original capital of America, so a lot of those prominent figures from the Revolutionary War era spent at least some time in the city. And so with that, there's conversation about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, where these men were involved with structuring America, the Constitution, and this fight for independence in America while owning slaves. In particular, these two men had well-regarded and highly noted chefs working for them who were enslaved. For Washington, this would have been Hercules, and for Jefferson, this would have been John Hemings, the older brother of Sally Hemings. A few years ago, I set a goal for myself where, to better understand U.S. policy, I was going to read a biography, or at least one, about each of the American presidents. I got through a few before getting wrapped up in other things, but I remember reading about Washington and Jefferson where the authors touched on their contradictions and hypocrisy, that in this fight for, while fighting for freedom, they were holding black people in bondage. At the very same time that these two men were drafting this constitution and creating what's supposed to be an elite example of democracy, unlike any the world had ever seen, they personally owned slaves. That's not to say that they were the only ones, but it's noted here because some of the people they held as slaves were master chefs. In the case of Hercules, they don't really go too into detail about the specific dishes that he was known for, but just that he was a really good chef. In the case of Hemings, there's conversation that when Thomas Jefferson went to France, where he spent like quite a number of years, he took Hemings along to have him learn French cooking. 
And so one of the things that he brought with him, brought back to America was macaroni and cheese or the knowledge of how to make macaroni and cheese. It's similar to the dish we have now where it's baked, but the steps vary. It was interesting to get some insight into this dish that's become so ubiquitous in American culture that we take it for granted. It's not something that you would associate with or think of as having been popularized by an enslaved person. This conversation takes place at Jefferson's Monticello estate where a descendant of the Hemings family is present. They discuss culture, inventions, and other contributions to American society made by black people. Things that we take for granted that are such a part of American life and culture that we don't really think about or readily recognize as having been contributions of black people. The focus then shifts to New York City where quite often when we think about slavery we think about the South. And I think in part that's because when slavery ended it mostly just existed in the South. But slavery did in fact exist in the North and it only ended a few decades before it was abolished across the country. They don't really get into like the economics of New York's involvement, but rather that at that time, horses were a very popular street food, something you could eat on the go. And in New York, you had this one man in particular, Thomas Downing, who was himself free, was actually, I believe, the child of enslaved people who built an empire from selling and serving oysters. Not only was this businessman serving New York's finance people and power broker, but he was also an abolitionist and involved with what sounded basically like the Underground Railroad. So upstairs at his oyster house, money was being spent by people who likely had dealings in the slave trade, for example, bankers, lawyers, etc., while the basement was used to hide runaway slaves, which I think is just absolutely amazing. It's one of the lesser known stories from black history that really is the driving force behind why I do this show. I like sharing these things that I learn, but at the same time, it puts me in a position of finding these lesser known but incredible incredibly exciting and riveting stories. In the final episode, Satterfield then visits Texas, which is very well known for its barbecue and cowboy culture. But I was actually a little bit surprised that in discussing barbecue, they didn't hit up cities such as like Memphis and Kansas City. Memphis in particular, given its history with black history, meaning that it's a well-known destination for really great barbecue and music. I visited in 2020, love the people, food, culture, but I didn't have a problem with Texas being included, but I was just surprised that Memphis wasn't. But then again, I guess the same could be said for New Orleans, right? And if you're doing like a four episode show, there's only but so many places you can cover. The time that Satterfield spent in Texas was certainly worth including, as I learned quite a bit. I was previously aware of Juneteenth, but I really appreciated getting a more in-depth look into the history of Juneteenth and also a different perspective. I've read about the origins of the holiday and celebration, but to see Darrell, God. who's a baker, you know, that she puts together this collection of different desserts inspired by Juneteenth was amazing. To then have this historian explain the symbolism and the significance of different things things used as part of the Juneteenth celebration was actually pretty cool. I felt Jarell guy who got emotional while speaking about how much cooking means to her and that being in the kitchen is a place of solace for her. I don't necessarily regard food or cooking in the same way, but rather that I have my own food memories and emotional connection to food. I have a lot of positive memories of having very big dinners with my family when I was growing up, large holiday meals or just family gatherings that centered around food. Some of my most cherished memories as a child involved older people in my family, whether baking bread, cakes, or whatever involving me in the process then making bread and like giving you a little piece that you could roll out and make your own little bread helping to mix cake batter and then get in like the bowl and the paddles or the spoon or whatever afterwards I remember being a little kid and baking cookies with my grandma and then as I got older, making different recipes with my mom, and it's something that I even do now, they're memories that I cherish, especially as some of those family members have now passed on. But I was also just amazed by the desserts that she put together as they were fun and creative, new and different combinations where everything looked amazingly good. They moved on from that and got more into Texas culture, which so often, and as with so much of other aspects of American history where black people made contributions, they're often overlooked and not really part of the mainstream conversation. So it was cool to learn about the history of black cowboys, where many of the original cowboys were black in the sense that they were the individuals who were rustling cattle, especially back in the days of slavery. 
This documentary is really a collection of different things, right? Things that we take for granted as part of American culture, not really realizing that embedded in there is black culture, black history. So it was cool to learn a bit about rodeos and whatnot. I've had the opportunity over the last few years to see a bit more of the country, but thus far, the only place like out west that I visited would be Vegas and New Orleans, right? I've been to Vegas twice, but didn't even make it off the strip. As a result of watching this and some other things, I have a list of places that I would love to visit. And much of it admittedly is based on places with good food, especially when there's an opportunity to learn a little bit about black history that's local to a particular area. Overall, I feel like High on the Hog is an incredible series. In the earlier episodes, I felt a connection in the sense of there were things that I identified as being part of my own culture, right? And then beyond that, I found it was really cool then to also learn about things that were completely new to me as they were outside of my experience and the experience of my ancestors. As someone with an interest in history and food, this was a perfect program for me. I love things like this that allow me to peek into lives and culture that feel somewhat familiar, but also when it has something new and different for me to learn about and experience. Like I said, I'm into black culture and black history, but I'm curious about culture and history in general. So a show like this is perfect for me. The only drawback I would say, which isn't really a drawback, is that it's just four episodes. I would love to see the show like cover some other place. For example, I would love to learn about Memphis, Nashville, the Mississippi Delta, New Orleans, LA, Chicago, even Boston, right? From this perspective, the combination of culture, food, history from a black perspective. Three of the four episodes were based here in America, but they spent some time in Africa and that was dope. As someone of Caribbean descent, I would love for Satterfield to provide similar coverage of maybe one of the islands, such as like Jamaica, Cuba, or Haiti, just to get a different perspective on that history for like the country to get similar treatment as what's done here. You know, Satterfield might be able to present this combination of food, culture, and black history. It's a great service, right? High on the Hog is just four episodes that each run about an hour long, and thus far it's just one season. I read online somewhere that the show was renewed for a second season, but the article was from like early 22. So I don't know if that's still happening. If a second season does happen and it's anywhere near the quality and caliber of the first season, I'm certainly going to be here for it. But until then, I would highly recommend checking this out. I don't think you'll go wrong with it. And I think if you're interested in food, if you're interested in black culture, black history, you certainly enjoy the show. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. If you enjoyed this episode and want more, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my movie review playlist.